Good morning, class. <clears throat> We're back once again. Uh, it is uh, Monday, April 20th, about 11 o'clock a.m. So I think it's time to uh, <clears throat> hit the primary secondary one more time. And we won't get finished, but uh, hopefully this week we'll get finished this document and then we'll just have some mop up to do next week. I'm gonna get another homework assignment out to you before long. Uh, I think I had pretty good response on the last one. I just started looking over those and uh, I should be finished before too long. Okay, so uh, we talked about figure 56 uh, in the previous lecture. So we're on to 57. And what this is, this is a simplified changeover uh, that eliminates uh, a great many operating changeover problems. So changeover refers to a two pipe system. In the winter time, we would circulate uh, hot water. And in the summer, we would circulate chill water through the same pipes. Uh, all the air handlers would just have uh, one coil, could be a fan coil unit, could be a unit vent, uh, whatever, but uh, whatever uh, conditioning coils are out there, uh, there's just one per unit. Uh, fan blows across it, it gets hot water when it's cold outside, and it gets uh, chill water. Uh, I'm sorry, it gets hot water, yeah, when it's cold outside, and chill water uh, when it's hot outside. So uh, this is kind of what the picture looks like. <clears throat> the system pump operates continuously. So we're gonna circulate the loop all of the time. And the changeover from heating to cooling or uh, vice versa back and forth is affected by a simple two position switch, which either energizes the boiler circuit or the chiller circuit. So we're either gonna run uh, the boiler pump and the boiler or the chiller pump and the chiller. Uh, boiler side activation starts the boiler and its injection pump. Injection pump controls system water temperatures to reset requirements. And so you see we have this little bulb in the outdoor air that indicates that we're going to reset the uh, loop temperature uh, with outside air. So when it's cold outside, uh, we'll have hotter water circulating, and when it's not quite so cold, maybe 40, 35, <clears throat> we still have to do some heat, but we don't need our uh, highest water temperature. Chiller side activation uh, starts the chiller and its pump. <clears throat> when the overriding aquastat determines that system water temperature is low enough, someplace around 85 degrees to permit introduction into the chiller. Now you do have to be careful on this type of a system. If we've been running the boiler, that water temperature may be too hot to put into a chiller. So 85 would probably be a maximum. You probably wouldn't really want to do it till 70 or something like that. So what you have to do, if you're coming off of heating, you have to simply turn off the boiler, keep the chiller off and just circulate the uh, continuous pump through the loop and it will, heat losses and there may be some areas still doing a little bit of heat will eventually cool the water down to the point that it's safe to put it in the chiller. And that's what that overriding aquastat is for. Likewise, you have to be careful about putting too cold water into the boiler. So we have to have some, uh, some logic or if this is a manually operated system, whoever is actually turning on and off the chiller and boiler pumps have to realize they got to check the loop temperature before on a changeover before they just fire up the next piece of equipment. Uh, the changeover system described in this figure has been applied with great success with cast iron boilers and with small steel boilers less than say 250,000 MBH gross input application to large uh, fire tube steel boilers should be reference to the boiler manufacturer for their consideration, uh, taking into account the possibility of boiler shock, and that's what I was talking about. So there we may run into this uh, a little bit more later. Uh, let's move on to point number 18 here. And so what we have, we have a <coughs> three-way, a modulating three-way valve control applications. 
instead of primary, secondary. And this is a preliminary type discussion. So modulating throughway valves are used in three different basic arrangements for primary, secondary application. So here's a, a mixing valve type situation. And notice uh, this may not be an ideal because we've got that uh, control valve pressure drop on the suction side of the pump. So, uh, you know, they draw it up so it can be done, uh, but nonetheless, and it's also sized for the secondary flow, which may or may not be the smallest flow. The crossover flow may be smaller, and that can be an issue, but anyway. So you can see, um, if you uh, piped it up as in 58, as the, uh, the control valve could uh, basically block off the return port from the secondary and force all of the crossover bridge flow up into the secondary uh, or a portion of it. Uh, there could be some mixing, whatever came up the lead riser would go down the return uh, lead riser. And then the common pipe uh, is located in the crossover. Okay, so take a look at that. Uh, here's a bypass instead of a mixing valve, a bypass or uh, a uh, diverting valve in the secondary. And similar type situation, it's just on the other side where the uh, diverting valve has one inlet and two outlets. And I didn't say that, but on the mixing valve, it has uh, two inlets and one outlet. Uh, we've been over that before. Uh, the bypass or diverting valve <laughs> application in this figure 59 is preferred to the mixing application since it solves the secondary circuit pressure drop problem, which is having that big pressure drop on the, I'll get them both up there, on the suction side of the pump. Uh, the, and also there's another problem, the flow control uh, valve swing or the, the way it opens to flow is such that secondary pressure can never be less than primary pressure down here because um, whatever pressure we have here will be, can be transmitted through the valve up to this point and this becomes kind of like the point Right down here is the point of no pressure change, and you don't have much through that valve, so it's pretty close right there. Um, <clears throat> size now, in, 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 in this case, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, the flow is blocked in the other direction. And so if this cool, if this is shut off and we're just circulating and this cools down, we can, that water can contract and we can get a very low pressure on this side, which can contribute to uh, pump cavitation. But we'll talk more about that later. Uh, arrangement 60, which we'll go to here. Arrangement 60 overcomes the problems noted above and is highly recommended. The arrangement has the following advantages. So we're talking about this figure right here, number 60. The control valve is sized to the crossover bridge flow rate, which is always the controlling flow rate. So if you're a chill water uh, application, most likely this crossover bridge flow rate is going to be the same as the secondary because we don't want to really do any mixing up here in the secondary. So this issue is not so important for the chill water, but for the heating situation, this flow, if we have a big delta T designed across the primary, uh, for the primary water to the uh, supply to the return, then this flow is going to be much less than the flow up here. If we put the valve up here, then we're going to have to size the control valve for the higher flow, which is going to give us less controllability over this lower flow rate, which is, you know, really what we want to control accurately. So a lot of our examples, we've had 40 GPM up here and 10 GPM down here. So it's this 10 GPM that I really want to control. And so if I put the control valve down here, 
then I can size it to control, you know, the, the 10 GPM and the 40 GPM never goes through the control valve. I simply control how much of the hot water is bled into the secondary and mixed at this point. So that's a definite uh, benefit. Uh, another benefit is the particular location of the three-way valve requires an underslung bleed riser. If the operator, if the valve operator is to be placed at the top of the valve, well, which is which is common. It doesn't have to be, but it's common. So see, this is the operator. We're showing it on top. Well, then that means the this uh, port that the return has to come in is pointing downward, and that's going to require this underslung um, return bleed riser coming in here. Uh, the underslung bleed riser provides a thermal anti-gravity flow leg, which eliminates the need for the flow control valve. Uh, so we get rid of, whereas if I, if I look, well here, here's one where it's flipped around and you see I've got the flow control valve to eliminate the gravity flow, but in this diagram, I don't have that. And it's because these are underslung. Okay, the pressure, uh, at the secondary circuit pump can never be less than the primary circuit pressure as developed in the crossover bridge. So we kind of talked about that. So that's a benefit up here. And the crossover bridge can be balanced by proper selection, i.e. proper CV rating on the three-way valve. Uh, I think you would probably still have these balance valves over here, but you may not need to use them near as much. Maybe they can stay open pretty much and you can do a lot of the balancing here by proper selection of the CV. Uh, it will be noted that the common piping has been moved from its conventional location in the crossover bridge to a new location in the secondary circuit. When I do this, see I'm introducing a pressure drop down here, um, and so that requires that my common pipe be up here in the secondary. So that's a little bit different. Okay, so this just shows uh, what can ha what will happen if we don't uh, underslung and we have to come in, we're coming in, we put the uh, actuator on the bottom of the valve and that adds the flow control valve. For these applications, yeah, let's get them both up there. Um, the secondary zone pump is in continuous operation Secondary water temperature is modulated up or down depending on the amount of primary water the three-way valve admits into the secondary through the bleed riser. So, you know, however much uh, we allow out here, that is how much we allow to go up into here and that then adjusts the temperature. Uh, control of the secondary circuit is thus vested in uh, water temperature change rather than flow change control established by bypass control methods. And I'll have some more comments on that in just a second. Um, the continuous flow established by primary secondary arrangements has important advantages when secondary zones are to be separately reset and is most especially advantageous for freeze protection of air handler coils. So the freeze protection comes from continuously pumping as well as, you know, you could, um, if you have control of airflow, you could keep the water temperature a little bit warmer. Uh, so, but anyway, those are advantages. Now, let's see. Uh, where did I want to go to? I want to go here. Okay, so this is back from our control valve uh, discussion, the previous uh, presentations. And if you remember this, this is assuming that the temperatures of the water is the same. And this is how the, as we reduce the flow rate, uh, the heat delivered by a coil is going to drop off. 
and remember, um, we have to get at a 50% reduction in flow rate, we've only dropped 10%. That's because the water spends longer in the coil and it comes out cold. So that's kind of an issue. Now, let me pull up this other slide we had. Right here, if we can control with temperature variation, if you remember this, um, if we keep the flow rate the same, and here, if we adjust uh, the delta T between the air side and the water side by doing, uh, say, hot water reset with outside air, or, or with, we can do it uh, based on the thermostat. So it, it, we get a linear curve. So if we chop the delta T in half the same flow rate, we get half of the heat transfer. If we drop the delta T uh, to by 80%, to 20%, you see it's linear. And that makes the control a whole lot easier. Now, if we're gonna do the flow control, then we wound up over here by trying to pick the proper type of valve seat configuration. And I think that Honeywell video had some discussion on this. But if so if we're doing flow control, if we pair uh, or if we select that control valve to be an equal percentage valve, then you see we get this drastic reduction in flow, which then gets us, you know, the combination would be it's like you've got the coil characteristic will look something like this, even though that's not what this is exactly supposed to represent, but it, it's a similar curve. <clears throat> and then if you pair that with the equal percentage valve, you come out with a performance that's roughly linear. And so that's what people do if they're going to rely on the flow control. Okay, so back, back to this. Uh, I think we pretty much finished that. Uh, well, let's see, let's go back up here. Okay, the application in figure 58, and I'm gonna go put this up here while we go through this little discussion, uh, has this fi figure 58 arrangement um, has been in common usage for some time and despite some serious disadvantages has performed well, uh, and, but we need to, we wanna illustrate the disadvantages. I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger here, okay. One, the three-way valve is interposed as a pressure drop directly at the secondary pump suction. Should valve pressure drop be high, the secondary pump can go into cavitation and result in pump damage and reduced uh, flow rate. So problem number one, this valve, which oftentimes even wide open has a significant, for controllability has a significant Pressure drop is right sitting there on the suction for the pump. So that's not a good situation. Two, the flow control valve is intended to stop one pipe internal gravity flow from the primary to the secondary when the three-way valve is closed to the bleed riser. So no load demand. So this is shut off and I've got hot water down here and I've got cooler water up here and we're afraid that if I don't have this a uh, little check valve in here that will stop any gravity flow up through here and get in this, which will cause the space to uh, overheat. Uh, but what will happen, uh, let's see, um, a decrease in secondary circuit water temperature will then cause contraction and rapid reduction in system pressure. So say we can't flow water back up here, this is blocking it. And so this continues to circulate. Well, there's no load or it's, the space is hot, but eventually uh, this is gonna cool down just from piping losses, even if there's nothing, we're not dropping anything much at the radiator and then probably would be dropping a little bit. So is it, then this is gonna contract and this is a closed loop and so that's gonna cause this pressure to drop significantly and that can cavitate the pump. <clears throat> so that's a problem. Um, and the third problem here, <clears throat> or 
a third, yeah, the third and final problem here is this valve is uh, line size to the secondary flow rate. And if this is the flow rate I'm trying to control and it's much less then this valve is oversized for the flow it's trying to control. Uh, and so you don't get good controllability. So your control valve's oversized for what you're really trying to do. So those are the three reasons that we don't really like this, that we much prefer, uh, say, this one, and I can make this smaller again, or this one, either one. Okay, so we're going on to 19 here, and this is the picture. Okay, so uh, article 19, pipe and valve sizing for a three-way modulating valve application to primary secondary pumping. Uh, okay, so we see we got uh, the bleed risers uh, are sized to the full load primary crossover flow and is equal in size to the crossover pipe size. So, you know, the purpose of this is to be able to transmit the crossover flow through these pipes, through the risers up here into the secondary. So whatever this flow is in the crossover, in this case, I guess it's 40, these have to be sized for 40 GPM. This has to be sized for 40. All of this has to be sized for whatever the crossover bridge flow is. Now in this particular, uh, application. This was probably a cooling because we're, the secondary is also sized for 40 GPM. So in this case, this is all going to be two inch piping. If this was a heating situation, then this might be 10 and this might be 40, in which case all of this piping could be downsized. <clears throat> okay, the control valve is sized to the crossover flow requirement and to some stated pressure drop, it would be usual or typical to assign approximately 10 foot pressure drop to this valve unless balance requirements dictate otherwise. So for us, if, if, you, if we're gonna apply this, we're gonna size this in the wide open condition for a 10 foot drop, okay? And so you can see if you get out your uh, well, here we'll do it on the calculator. So 10 foot, if you remember the equation, it's what Q is equal to CV times the square root of delta P and PSI divided by the specific gravity. Uh, this is cold water, so we're not going to, we haven't been making the specific gravity adjustments. Uh, so if I take 10 foot divided by 2.31 is about 4.33. I take the square root of that, store that away, and then I'm going to divide that into 40 GPM, 40 divided by, and it comes out 19.22, so the CV is 19. So you should verify that just as a, a little bit of a review. Okay, I think that's about all on that one. Let's go down to this one. And so this is the heating situation. So now the crossover bridge is sized to 10 GPM and the secondary is circulating 40. So the 40 GPM, whatever's carrying the 40 GPM has to be two inch pipe. Whatever's carrying just the 10 can be inch and a quarter. And so all of this through here, the valve, well, the valve is sized for the CV. It could be an inch and a quarter, it could be a one inch just depending on uh, what the control valve folks have to offer us. But all of the pipe is one and a quarter. Okay. All right. I think we're doing good here. Let's roll on to Article 20. Okay. Uh, 20 modulating three-way control application to primary secondary application illustrations. I just got a note up here, or several <laughs> sentences of notes. Uh, pumps and valves together can perform control functions, which valves alone or pumps alone cannot perform. 
in a closed loop hydronic circuit. Mixing of two different temperature waters can only take place through action of a pump. The modulating control valve provides a controlled modula modulation rate of the mixed water, which can closely approach, can closely be approached by the rapid snap on off action of an injection pump. So anyway, you can get close to the same type of operation that you can get um, out of uh, snapping a pump on and off. I think you probably get much smoother operation. Uh, true mixed water temperature modulation can only be achieved, achieved by the modulating control valve pump combination. However, some application examples follow. Okay, so we see uh, 64 indoor outdoor reset <coughs> of the secondary. So basically we've got a dual temperature sensing control system. We sense the mixed water temperature going into the pump that's going to be circulated through the secondary. We also monitor the outside air temperature and we have some sort of a schedule built into the control that gives us a temperature, desired temperature, water temperature set point based on outside air condition. And so this valve simply modulates. If the water is too hot, it closes off, doesn't let as much warm water appear into the secondary. If this water is too cold, it modulates and forces more water back up through here by changing what it lets out of the um, secondary. Okay. Uh, so that's a, a control of water temperature. This would be a um, air temperature, a thermostat uh, in the space. And so you can directly control space temperature um, by controlling the position of that three-way uh, modulating valve. Okay. Um, and there's an, it's the same picture, but he changes the, the note. Uh, air handler freeze protection plus air temperature control. So, you know, I guess you could build some additional logic in here. Or if you had uh, control of the uh, fan air volume, uh, you could blade a little bit warmer uh, water in to protect the coil and just reduce the airflow a little bit. Uh, to not overheat the space. So it depends on, you know, the overall system capabilities. Okay, what do we have now? Okay, so we have circulated domestic water storage tank. Again, wild flow heat source, that means that there's no control valve. Whatever that heat source is, it's flowing through the shell of that shell and tube heat exchanger continuously. And then uh, this is my tank. This is my recirculation to keep the water hot in my hot water system going to all my lavatories and sinks and wherever it's going. Uh, there's my storage tank. <clears throat> and what I'm doing is I'm recirculating water continuously through here. And if it gets too cool coming out of here, then I simply uh, force some of it through this heat exchanger, pick up some heat, comes back in, heats the tank up again. So pretty straightforward. Uh, here is an industrial fluid uh, temperature control system. Again, my heat exchanger is running wild, as we say. Uh, got a storage tank. I'm circulating. Uh, I pull off of here, go out to my system. Um, I come back in. This could be return water, could be a combination of makeup water. I could bleed some water either into the tank based on a level control, or I could make it up, uh, mix it out here and put it in with this fluid. At any rate, um, I'm sensing the water temperature that is going back in to the tank. If it's too cold, then I'm gonna force it through the heat exchanger and it'll modulate back and forth continually. Um, 
Okay, let's see. So what I have here is a, another, a little bit more sophisticated of a changeover system. We had just that two position earlier. And so this uh, illustrates the changeover is accomplished by, again, this is a two position switch uh, activating either the chiller or boiler circuits. I guess this is pretty much what we had before. We're just gonna provide some more detail uh, here. Uh, for heating, the boiler pump flows the boiler continuously at an established flow rate. So that's the pump here. So we're gonna, we're gonna, I guess we're going this way, going around in the wrong direction. Okay. Um, the three way valve reset system water as required. So again, I've got a reset controller. I'm sensing out your air. I'm sensing water temperature uh, in the loop. And I'm also sensing boiler water temperature. Okay. Uh, and so we're just going to reset with outside air, except when overridden, overridden by a high temperature difference signal between boiler supply and return as might occur after a shutdown, say we have a cold system that's been shut down, or we're changed over. Say it could be we need an air conditioning during the daytime and now it's five, six o'clock at night, it's starting to cool down and I wanna switch over to heating. Uh, and with the boiler up to temperature. So if the boiler is, is hot, I can't just dump cold, chill water uh, directly into the boiler. So I have to be careful. I'm going to check the differential from the boiler water to the return water and make sure that I don't shock this boiler. Uh, the arrangement shown will bleed system water into the boiler circuit at a controlled rate until full reset temperature is reached. So we're going to be careful how much of this cold water we allow into the boiler to protect the boiler. And then gradually we'll bring this thing up. So it may take a little bit of time to accomplish that. Uh, on the, uh, for cooling, the uh, chiller flow rate is continuous, eliminating chiller load control problems as often caused by system flow variation. Uh, we, you know, some people are variable flow and chiller evaporators, but you know, that's relatively new stuff. Uh, in the past, not a lot of that has been done. The three-way valve permits immediate use of the chiller to cool down residual uh, hot system water during a changeover from heating to cooling. The three-way opens to bypass with entering chill water over 80 and modulates to full open uh, to the system when chiller entering water is 70. A chiller pump and chiller stop override aquastat with manual restart is set for approximately 90 as a secondary safety to prevent entry of hot water into the chiller. So again, we've got some logic uh, built into this to protect the chiller from too hot water. And again, it's a bleed type situation. If this loop is warm up here, we're gonna slowly bleed it into the chiller uh, circuit so it can cool it down here and then we can cool down the loop. And given some time, we can get it back down to the cooling temperature, typical cooling set points. <clears throat> Okay, and these two are kind of beyond the scope. There's not very good uh, explanation of this, and this is a pretty complicated mess, to be honest with you. So I'm gonna skip 70 and 71, uh, and we're gonna jump back in here at uh, figure 72 and bullet point, or article 21, which is looking at modulating two-way 
There we go. Okay, modulating two-way valves are applied to primary secondary control. Their proper operation, catch this, their proper operation leads to superior performance. Improper application, however, can lead to serious operating problems. The typical application is shown below. Okay, so this is a little bit different. In the two-way valve application, the controlling input flow from the primary crossover bridge to the secondary circuit is caused by a restrictive pressure drop in the secondary circuit between the bleed risers. That would be right here, okay? So the common pipe moves down here to the crossover bridge. And because what, what, what's gonna happen if, if this valve is wide open, it still has a pressure drop across it. If I don't have anything up here in this secondary, um, this valve opens, but I'm not gonna get very much flow through here because this is, if this is just a straight pipe, this flow is just gonna continue to circulate uh, because I've got pressure drop across this leg. And so this pressure drop this restrictive flow causing pressure drop is there because of the pressure drop across the, the two-way modulating valve, even in the wide open position. That's kind of what's going on. Um, and of course, Bell and Gossett, instead of putting an actual balance valve in there, Bell and Gossett makes what they call monoflow fittings that accomplish this pressure drop. And so their picture looks like this. But when you see these monoflow fittings in, these, this little, in, in this article that are look like this, what these things do is described in this picture. So those two fittings equal this. And uh, they may show it one way or they may show it uh, another way. Okay. Okay, so uh, bleed flow rate from the primary crossover bridge to the secondary is under control of the modulating valve. So I think I'm gonna go, I like this one a little better just because you see that pressure drop there instead of just looking at those two silly fittings. But anyway, so the amount, once this thing is set up properly, the amount of flow that comes up here is controlled by this valve position. Uh, two-way control valve, two-way, I'm sorry, two-way valve control uh, should not be applied to primary secondary arrangements unless there is a complete understanding of the fact that a flow variation in the secondary circuit of substantial proportion can occur because of the control operation of the valve and due to improper flow and pressure drop ratios. Okay, so what that's saying, and it takes a little while with this before you kind of catch on, but what they're saying is, if this thing is not set up properly, let's say this valve is wide open, we might get, just pick a number, um, 100 GPM. Even though this is, a, this is a constant speed pump, and it's just pumping the secondary, with this valve wide open, we might get 100 GPM. With this valve closed, we might get 50 GPM in the secondary out of a constant speed pump. Well, that kind of a change in flow up here in the secondary, just based on your control valve, is that this is trying to control temperature. It's not trying to control the flow rate in the secondary, but if the ratios aren't right, the, the, the movement of this valve from full open to full close will affect the flow rate up here in the secondary, which can be a disaster. So that's the problem that they're talking about and that we're going to have to uh, uh, fight our way through here. Okay, reductions in the secondary flow rate 
from the control valve wide open position to the control valve closed position will depend on two ratios. The first, yeah, I'll go ahead and roll this up here. There we go, you can see it. So one, the full load ratio of secondary flow rate to the primary flow rate. Okay, so you just take whatever the, the full load, full load, that means when we're doing maximum heating or cooling, what's the ratio? If it's a chill water system, that ratio is gonna be 100%. If it's uh, a hot water system with really hot water, that ratio might be you know, 20, 30, 40%, okay? Secondary flow rate to the primary input flow rate. Okay, so that's, that's point one. And point two is the ratio of the restrictive flow causing pressure drop to the secondary circuit total pump head. Okay, so if we come up here, so this is the uh, pressure causing uh, drop in the secondary right here across this valve, which is also denoted by these two monoflow fittings. And this, whatever the total pump head is across the secondary pump. Okay, so there you go. So for that ratio, we take the pressure drop, restrictive pressure drop, uh, PSI one minus PSI two, because the pressure is gonna be higher here than here. So you take that delta P and you divide it by the pump head. And then for the other ratio, you take the input flow A and divide it by the secondary flow. Those are the two ratios that we care about. Okay. All right. So now we have this table that kind of illustrates what can happen. Secondary circuit flow reduction from valve open to valve closed is shown below and for the ratios illustrated. So let's look at this. Okay. So up here on the kind of the horizontal axis, we have the percent riser input flow. So that's up through the crossover bridge, up through the riser. That's the really hot water or the chill water uh, divided by the secondary flow, whatever circulating in the secondary. Well, so it could be a really, really hot water system. We could only 10% of the secondary could be what comes up from the riser. The other 90% would be recirculated and mixed. Uh, on a situation where there's only slightly elevated temperature in the crossover bridge, 90%. So you take the, let's say, let's say the secondary flow is 100, that would mean that the crossover flow was 90. If the secondary flow is 100, this would say that the crossover flow is only 10, okay? And so that's what these percents are. And then on this side, this is the percent restrictive pressure drop to the total pump head. So that's taken this, delta P across here and divided by total pump head. Okay. So if the, uh, let's say we're dropping, uh, oh, let's say we got a hundred feet across the, uh, the pump in terms of PSI, if I take a hundred, say divided by 2.31, that would say I've got say 43.3 PSI is the delta P across the pump turns out to be 100 feet, and I've, only, I've got a 10 foot drop across the control valve, then that would be 10 divided by 100, that would be 10%, so I would be here, okay? If I had 70 feet across the control valve and 100 feet across the pump, then it would be 0.7. Now, all right, let's get down here. So, table two illustrates that two-way Modulating valves have a limited but variable but valuable uh, application to primary secondary control arrangements. Two-way valves should only be applied when the input or controlling flow is a small portion, less than a third of the secondary flow. So that would say we've got to be, you know, there's 30%, 40%, so we gotta be pretty close. We can be a little bit over this 30% in terms of the flow ratio. 
and preferably when the restrictive pressure drop is less than 25% of the total secondary circuit pump head. So 25, we'd be halfway in here. So I'm kind of on that line and I'm over here or something like this. So basically, you know, I might bleed over a little bit, but you see, and, this, and the numbers in here, this is the percent change in flow from wide open to wide, to, to fully shut in the secondary. So here, if I'm 10% and 10%, let's say I had 100 GPM and then on, it's only gonna change 1%, so maybe it goes to 99 GPM. Well, that doesn't cause any problem. That's not an issue at all. Okay, so if I was here, 2%, so it went to 98 GPM, well, that's not a problem. Here it went to uh, what? 95.5 GPM, well, that's starting to be a little more significant. Here, it goes to what, 92 and a half GPM. And here you start getting, you see, it, 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 as you get further out in here into the lower right section of the table, I mean, down here, you've got a 55% a change in secondary flow. That's not acceptable. You know, that's gonna cause you all kinds of problems. So when you design these two-way valves, you have to stay with ratios kind of up in this region in order for it to work well. Okay, uh, the rules stated uh, still leave considerable application room, however, for especially for a deep temperature drop hot water design as below. Uh, and as shown in two-way valve application examples on page 49. So we'll, we'll get there. Okay, so here is an example that supposedly works pretty well. So what do we got? So say we've got, oh, we've got 110. Yeah, we've got a deep drop on the primary, 240 to 130. We've got a 20 degree drop uh, across the secondary. So we got in at 150, out at 130, that makes 130 down here. And so that flow ratio is gonna be pretty good. If this, was, if this was 100 down here, it'd be five to one. So this is like five point something to, uh, to one as far as the flow ratio and that's, you know, that's gonna be like 20%. It's less than 20%. So we're on this one, we're going to be good up here. Then the other part just depends on uh, the delta P here versus the total pump head. Uh, note this application uh, is also used with medium temperature water systems in the 300 degree range. Uh, location of the control valve and the return bleed riser ensures that they will not be subject to high temperature operating problems, which is, so they're pointing out here that, say this valve is seeing like 130 degrees or so, 130, you know, if we're not quite at full design, but it, so, you know, there, it should see about 130 degrees. If you, if you had to put, if it was seeing 240 somehow that or 300, that could be, uh, an issue with the long-term uh, functioning of the valve. Okay, let's move on down. Okay, providing the application rules previously stated or followed, the two-way modulating uh, application would be sized as below for the particular flows and heads shown in 76. Okay, so let's take a look. One more, yeah, that's pretty good. <clears throat> okay, so what are we showing? We're showing uh, 10, 10 GPM in the crossover, and we're showing 40 GPM in the secondary, so that ratio is 25%, and we're showing three PSI, uh, restrictive pressure drop. So in terms of feet of head, what is that? That's three times 2.31. So that's not quite seven, 6.93. And 
and I got 30 feet on the pump, so I divided by 30, so that's like 23%. So that's less than 25, and on the flow side, I'm less than a third, so this should work just fine. And I'm also showing the, the CV, so you should check that. <clears throat> so what I want, I want to uh, see, and this three PSI here is the same as this three PSI here. So see, this is kind of mimics this. So um, this is selected for three, and then this CV is selected to kind of balance this with this. Okay, so uh, let's see. What do I want? I want, uh, I want three PSI and I want 10 GPM. So I take three PSI, I take the square root of it, store one, and then I take 10 divided by recall and I get 5.77, 5.7. So that works. And I've got 10 GPM, so I got one and a quarter inch pipe. So pretty good. Not all that hard, just uh, just a lot of stuff to kind of keep in mind. All right, let's move on down here, see what we got. We've got uh, modulating two-way valve primary secondary applications. Uh, applications are generally limited to design involving considerable design temperature drop difference between the primary and secondary circuits. Well, I think they're pretty good on that. Um, when the required conditions are established, the two-way valve should be used. It is generally considered a superior control instrument compared to the three-way, especially for small flow control requirements and is less expensive. So if you're doing a design, you should try to control that secondary uh, the, the bleed from the crossover into the secondary with the two-way valve, if you can make it work. So here's a, another example. And you see, this is the 100 degree uh, delta T on the primary, 240 minus 140, so that's 100. And I've got 20 degrees on my secondary, 160 in, 140 out. And so if I take that, uh, that, 100 and divide by 20, that ratio is five. And so it's, you can say it's a 20% flow ratio. So 20% of the secondary is the crossover flow. And so, you know, it's below a third, so that's good. So then you just, hopefully you get your pressures right and <clears throat> you're, you're good, to, good to go. Uh, here's another, example and you see here uh, this we got so we've got three-way valves up here on each air handler but I've got a two-way valve controlling the injection of hot water into the secondary circulating route. So now as these things modulate um, you know you'll have a balancing valve that's not shown in the in the bypasses here and so if you got full flow through the coil or full flow through the bypass, as the bypass is balanced to be the same as the coil, you'll have constant flow across here. But if you go to the 50-50 condition, then the pressure drop falls because you're splitting the flow. You've only got 50% of the flow, which gives you 25% of the pressure drop across the coil and across here. So there is a pressure fluctuation based on this up here in the secondary, uh, based on the operation of these valves. Okay, here's uh, panel heating. This could be uh, embedded in concrete, uh, something like that. <clears throat> so again, we're showing uh, the same uh, uh, flow ratio, <clears throat> 20 degree or 20% flow ratio. So we've got 100 degrees uh, drop in the uh, primary water from supply to return, and we've got 20 degrees on the secondary. And we can reset, we're showing a bulb, so we can reset both outside here. All right. Let's move down here. Okay, so 
figure those two previous figures uh, illustrate application to low temperature design less than 250. As noted in figure 75, the same design principles often used with medium temperature water up around 300. <clears throat> so 79 uh, is an adaptation of a wild flowing steam to water exchanger uh, that's been used in the past. Uh, you can read all that stuff, by Mr. W.A. Goodman, high rise application. Uh, to avoid high pressure hot water boiler problem, the exchanger is wild, there's no control valve. Uh, it's located over the boiler, so it doesn't require steam traps that it condenses and falls back into the boiler. Uh, the particular design circumstances are such that a relatively small two-way valve could be used for reset during heating season, providing the exchanger is sized to yield approximately 200 degrees of water per hour. So be it. Okay. Let's move on. Okay, primary design, i tell you what, I think, uh, I think this is a good place to stop. This is, I've been droning on for a while here. <laughs> so I'll uh, cut this off and post it. Uh, and then I'll, uh, I don't know, this afternoon or tomorrow, I'll start at 24 here. And uh, we're not too far. You know, we've got some examples down here we got to go through. I guess we've still got a little ways to go on this thing. But uh, anyway, uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty good. Pretty good stuff. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to cut this off right now, and I'll be back in touch uh, shortly.